surrounded by three men. It's a dark room. It's not the first time. One to my right is in a navy blue jumper and light blue jeans, some khaki slash brown walking boots, a little cut on his right arm, a swollen right hand, a swollen knee. We'll talk about that later. Hi, John Wilkin. Hello. Good evening, Will. Two men to my left is a man dressed in black, all black, black shoes, a black canvassy top with a... Do you know this isn't on radio, Will? So sponsor. Can see. Shh, 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 okay. Fingers on lips. Johnny Cash. A canvassy top with a sports logo brand, which he wears. He's not sponsored by them. He hopes to be, but he's he keeps wearing that, that brand sponsored. every week. But more importantly, in the middle of the two men to my left is another man who is a very tall man. He's got a green army coloured polo top on. Grey hair, suits it, George Clooney. Grey beard, I'd say <laughs> about six to seven millimetres of stubble slash beard on his face. Some black sports shoes on as well, yeah. looking very fine. Everyone knows about the exterior of Mr. Brian McDermott, but no one really knows too much about what goes on inside Brian's head, mind, soul and body. And we're going to find that out over the next 48 <laughs> minutes. Is that, is that possible, Ryan? Is that <clears throat> you told me this was going to be just look pretty light-hearted. <laughs> it's light-hearted. We yeah. just touch on the top of the surface <laughs> of things, but can I leave now if that's the intro? <laughs> the doors are locked. I'm tapping there out There is now. no leaving. There is no leaving. Brian, it's great to have you on, in all seriousness. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Up My some pleasure. Of your time. Um, look, I, I say that because everyone, first people, I mean, like, this is the first time I've met you, and you're looking at me very strangely, thinking, who is this guy? Uh, but a lot of people see you and see you as this tough, you're already raising your right eyebrow at me, tough exterior. You do give off an image, don't you? How would you, firstly, before we get into more about you, how would you describe yourself? Well, I don't think I would. I, uh, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I get what people see. I understand what people see. Yeah. Uh, Easily not liked. I think that's the best way of describing it. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you care about that? Uh, it, it doesn't drive me day. It doesn't drive me working day at all. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, wow, well, it gets deep. This because you know, you, Wilco knows I can be relatively deep with things. But uh, no, I don't care about it. But uh, I think that's more to do with other people's perceptions or fears or insecurities, mm. if that makes any sense. Than you know, I, I don't think <clears throat> if there's any criticism of myself that I'd give is that I don't I don't consider what other people are thinking, especially the fans. You know, not intentionally and not in a, in a dismissive way, but mm. whenever I do an interview after a game or or before a game, I'm pretty much talking to my players, mm. and that's it. And that's all that's all I want them to hear. You yeah. know, and sometimes I'd, I'd go visit that. So I think people do get the negative version of me instantly you know from the perception of it which yeah i can't really blame them I, i'm really interested because um i think it was in 2003 when you finished playing you described yourself as a prick yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i'll go with that i'll still go with your that, words yeah. i'm not yeah. Yeah, your yeah, words. yeah yeah that you said that that you you had to change and i think it was and we'll, we'll, go th we'll go through this in a, in a different kind of order. But you, you came across Tony Smith. Yeah. And he changed you as a man for the better. He, he made you, in your words, a better bloke. Well, the coach, you know, without going too too far, he, you know, he didn't change me as a bloke, but he changed me as a coach, for sure. Mm. So I'm talking, the, the, the premise of that was uh, me as a coach. Okay. So when I think back, I would not have been wanted to be coached by the bloke I was as a player. Mm. Uh, and that needed to change, so... I started coaching with a guy called Cal Chapman as an amateur, and he invited me to coach. Never had any intention of coaching, never thought about coaching, and I was the opposite way. I didn't want anything to do with anybody who were telling me what to do. I'd pretty much uh, go the other way, but uh, he invited me to coach, and I, I thought it was great instantly. After yeah. one session, I thought, wow, this is, uh, and maybe my ego speaking, but a group of people listening to what I was saying, you know? Yeah. And I, I thought it was great instantly. So when I packed in playing at the age of 32, uh, I went with Tony Smith for a season at Huddersfield and it was a really hard period because Smithy was holding me accountable for some of the shit that came out of my mouth, which yeah. there was a lot of back then. And uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like, he, you know, he was, 
he had a certain style as well, Smithy, which was very effective, but it was harsh. It was an harsh yeah. way of, of operating underneath him. What sort of stuff didn't you like? Well, he'd it, it asked me to back up opinions. He'd asked me to uh, to justify what I was doing. He'd asked me to uh, to put some thought into what I was, what I, what my opinions were, and I'd never done any of that. Mm. It was just whatever sounded good at the time. Mm. You know, you got, you're talking to a guy who came out in the military and and had done some crazy stuff in the military. Some of me, uh, my home life before I joined the military it wasn't great either. And when I think back, you know, uh, when by the time I retired, I hadn't progressed on from an 18-year-old guy who, who, or 17-year-old guy who joined the military. Mm. Can you share any of that with us? I mean, like, as much as you're willing to share, what, what, that's the first I've heard of that in your life before going into the Marines. What was so bad? Well, it's just uh, it was just the usual Catholic upbringing, which was uh, full of lies, full of uh, full of bullshit, uh, full of massive wrongs that went on. Mm. Uh, you know, I think one of the best things we're describing, I could tell you, which this describes everything really. So I was an altar boy, right? What about oh, yeah. this? What an altar boy, yeah. Well, I had to be. This is, this is news. Yeah. This is news. Yeah. Yeah, well, you've got to go through a period. I think every Catholic lad gets forced to be an altar boy for a while. Yeah. So I lasted a couple of weeks and I thought, no chance. I'm not. But the 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 uh, the moment when I said, no, nah, this won't work, is uh, after, after mass once. My mum said, right, you must stay behind and help the priest and help tidy things away, put the in books away and all that. And there was a couple of tramps that used to hang around the church back then. Uh, and afterwards, when I'm clearing the in books away, a tramp come and asked me to uh, to go back to his flat. And I was only about 11, maybe 12 or something like that. And I wasn't that aware of stuff like that, but I knew it was wrong. You know, you, I wasn't aware of what sex was, but I knew sex was something that adults did, that type yeah. of thing, you know? So I knew it was wrong. And he said, come back to my flat. And, uh, and I said, no, nah, no, nah, you're all right. And he, he he tried to persuade me in all ways of coming back to his flat. And the priest was listening and not saying anything. And uh, anyway, I just thought, that'll do. I put me in books down and ran home. Mm. And by the time I'd run home, I'd forgot about it. It wasn't that big a deal. But when uh, my dad, who never went to church, but was a Catholic and backed it, he backed to being a Catholic, but he wasn't a Catholic type of thing, but my mum was. He had, my dad said, oh, you've been to church, lad. How did it go? I says, oh, yeah, yeah. I says, and my mum said, did you help clear the books away like, it was, like I told you? I said, yeah, I did. I said, but that guy asked me to go back to his flat. And my dad said, what was that? And I almost like got my dad's attention. What was that? And, uh, and my mum told me to shut up straight away. And then uh, my mum and dad had this massive argument about how my dad had warned my mum that this bloke was doing it. And, you know, they should have said something before. And... Mm. And basically, the argument that didn't stop for ages was that my mum defending the church and my dad saying, it's a load of crap, you know, wow. you've, got to, you've got to deal with it. So it took me a while to work out, when I was like late teens, to work out that was just a classic Catholic trait. Go defend some massively wrong things for the state of the church. So you're not, you're not religious now, Mac? Is that, is that fair to say? Never was, no, never was. No, Nobody no. ever was when we were kids. Nobody ever... No. I didn't say prayers and I didn't believe in God when I was a kid. Uh, but you're a Catholic, there's a difference. Yeah. And we was a Catholic will be nodding now as listening to this. You can be a Catholic, but you might not believe in God, but you can be a good Catholic. I'm a Catholic and I can... Yeah, some of that resonates with me, I kind of... Some of my family were, I don't think, were good people. And some of me... Uh, you know, whether it be my granddads or uncles or whatever, I don't think they were great people. You listen to the stories that I get told, and I didn't know them too much and didn't meet them. Some of them were dead before I was born. But uh, they didn't seem to me to be very good people in society, but they were very good Catholics, though. So. Mm. And there's a difference. So, you know, there was, some, there was a lot of crap surrounding me when I, when I grew up. Was it a tough upbringing, though? Did you get on with your parents? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my mum, I'm one of ten. I'm the youngest of ten. Very, fair, it, yeah. very fertile family. Very, very fertile. fertile. So one of ten. It's not my, a lot of my mom, <laughs> by the time my mum had, had finished off with me when I was like 13, 14, 15, then I finished like, off probably the wrong phrase. Yeah. Well, finished off was like you know I don't need to be a mum anymore. I think she she was drained, you know, gone. My mum yes. and then my dad uh, wasn't the most doting dad you've ever had, but he was a good bloke, you know, yeah. hard working fella. Uh, worked himself into the ground, died early, I suppose, but. Uh, but me brothers and sisters, so me seven brothers, I'll probably get on with one of them and the rest of them are, you know, distant people that I, yeah. I half know. So it was, quite, it was quite a cold upbringing? Very much. That's a good way of describing it. Yeah, I'd yeah. agree with that. Very cold. And did that, I mean, 
essentially we should just do the podcast together, Brian. These two, that, do you know Mark Flanagan? The guy yeah, we met before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You met before, you know John, don't you? Yeah. Uh, you can ask questions now and then as well. No, no, I was listening. Like, oh, oh, in. That was well, already I'm me. fascinated because by just, again, going back to the exterior that you give off, exteriors can be massively deceiving, can't they? Never judge a book by its cover, John, which no, sometimes true. you do. So yeah. be careful with that one. Absolutely. But already there you've you know i would never had brian mcdermott down as a as an altar boy and i the, the, the child that i probably would have second guessed at some of that but did that lead you then to go into the to the route of going down this stiff military background and going into the marines and desperately no, wanting no, I'd a probably career run away I'd, I'd, I'd needed to get away from me my own life uh mm -hmm. I, I look back and i'm very resentful of of uh going through some stuff when i was 10 to the age of 15 16 very resentful so mm. i ended up like joining the military and almost just forgetting about my family and just and then that was my new family the royal marines and it was great weird you know and 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 quite a an extreme life really in many respects but it was it was the best thing ever the hardest thing ever the most uh <clears throat> i don't know the most Everything was just magnified. Everything, every emotion was magnified. Mm. You know, ha anger, aggression, happiness, teammates, everything. Loyalty. But, but, it, but, but it, like you say, you said it was a family. So essentially, they showed you some warmth and something that you, perhaps you didn't have in your. Well, in your I don't know if they showed you warmth, but they showed you the way of doing things. Right. For sure, they showed you warmth eventually, but they showed you the way of doing things, and, and all of a sudden, I was proud about myself. Mm. And having some pride. Which you weren't up until that point. No, no, nobody was. My mum and dad had this incredible trait of making you feel ashamed of yourself. And I think, again, that's not like a sob story. That's what most Catholic mums and dads do, wow. is make kids feel ashamed of themselves. Yeah. The Catholic philosophy is you are born with sin. Well, that's religion in itself, isn't it? Mm. And you've got to feel bad about yourself. And it's just that my mum and dad were experts at that. Mm. Uh, so by the time I joined up and went through, again, some uh, weird experiences, which... It's pointless regaling those because they always get lost in translation. So yeah. you, you just put that to one side and say, we just we did some crazy stuff. Uh, so the guy who left and then became a rugby league player, one of the most violent sports in the world. Mm. It was like, uh, it was a dream in heaven for me. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let, I want to just rewind you there. And I know I'm not, I completely appreciate and just give away as much as you, you, you're willing to do. But you... you for those who don't know, you, you served in Northern Ireland. Yeah. You served in the first Gulf War in Iraq. Yeah. I mean, you've seen some shit. Uh, not as much as the boys did in 2003 and those lads who were in Afghanistan. And the, those wars were just horrendous, you know. They, well, there weren't really wars. Uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland were were uh, crazy because you it wasn't a war, as, you, as you'd imagine, what you see in World War Two. There weren't a group of men coming running at you, shooting mm -hmm. at you. Mm. But and when they did, you know, it was it was from behind, it was undercover. So, uh, well, that, you know, that's <laughs> worse in some. Well, it, yeah, argument. I mean, look, it changes it, it changes it. But it, I don't, you know, you don't, but, but not for the worst either. You know, it's just part of what you do. And there's a really interesting story. You know, I met Brian Carney, and Brian Carney, obviously, he's Irish from from Dublin, and Dublin's not too far from the border. And when I was based in uh, Cross McGlen which is uh which is a town just north of the border uh and they call it bandit country because it's so close to the border that the uh the blokes over there the players over there would uh they'd be lively and go back over the border again you couldn't do anything once you're over the border mm. and uh quite often if we're if we're on patrol some of the uh the the locals young locals will come up and and try and kick off with you you know throw things at you and call your names or you know try and uh, try and draw you in and they're all about, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15. And a lot of them used to come up from the border, drive up in a car, call some shit, and then go back again. Mm. And I was talking to Brian Carney once in London, and he'd only just uh, started working with Sky. And I'd known Brian because he went on trial with Bradford, North, uh, Bradford Bulls, where I played. Yeah. We'd never talked to him at any length. And when he was working with Sky, he was with Phil Clark, had a coffee with him. I'm coaching at London. And uh, I asked him where he's from, from Dublin. And uh, I just had a joke. I just mentioned a joke to him. I said, you, you know, the Dundalk Road. And his face drops and he looked at me and says, oh, do you know about the Dundalk Road? And I, the Dundalk Road's a road that goes from, uh, you know, the village where we were, right up over to Dublin. Please and tell I, me this is going where I think it's going. And he, and he, <clears throat> Henry's saying, uh, well, that's what I was based when I was in the Marines. He says, you're kidding. <laughs> he says, you're no joking way. me. And uh, he asked me what year I was there. And his face dropped again. 
and uh, <laughs> there's a strong likelihood that uh, he'd have come up in a car. <laughs> Brian Carney was throwing stones at you. <laughs> pulling, <laughs> pulling and now donuts. he still is, metaphorically. But, uh, <laughs> what he's, he's just throwing them with the microphone instead. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, one of those surreal moments. And am I right in saying you only left the Marines because obviously like, you'd served and you'd seen some, some, some serious stuff, but you were sick of then being based in Kent and you were in barracks and you weren't doing anything. You didn't have that intensity that you wanted and what you joined for. Yeah, I I, uh, I got into some strife while I was in the military uh, and uh, when I was in Iraq, actually, and uh, I disobeyed a direct order, which is uh, which is it's big. You know, it's, it's a big wrong, you know, and it's uh, it's pointless trying to justify it now, but I, did, I disobeyed an order. And uh, when we got back from Iraq, I should have been on the boxing squad. I went, I went boxing again, and uh, I got drafted from the boxing squad, which doesn't happen. If you do sport in the military, you get left alone. Mm. You know, they leave you alone to finish off your sport, whatever you're doing. And I got drafted to uh, a place in Kent to go guard the bandsmen, and it was just like just guard duty. And I thought, well, that's probably me. I know where this is going. Mm. At some stage, I put me, uh, I filled a form out. They called it a chit. You fill a, you fill a chit out to, uh, to get promotion. And you've got to uh, you've got to fill a form out, and if your form gets accepted, you get uh, you become a candidate for three or four months. And if if you pass that period of three or four months, you you're then allowed to apply for a promotion. It's a long-winded process, but only the best, and it's right as well, should apply for a promotion. So to start with, you just got to fill the form out, and I fill the form out, and I went in front of my commanding officer, and he said, "What do you fill the form out for?" You know, and I'm actually in front of him filling the form out for a promotion. So it's a bit of a quick, uh, mm. weird question. I said, I don't understand. I, you know, I'm stood to attention in front of him, by the way, so you don't have a conversation. I, I looked at him puzzled. He said, I'm asking you, why have you filled this chat out? And I looked at him, I said, I don't understand your question, sir. He said, well, it's a simple question. Why have you filled the form out? And he knew why. I said, for promotion. He says, Matt Dermott, as long as my ass points downwards, you're never getting promotion. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, right, well, I better... Uh, and he knew you had to look elsewhere from that moment. Well, you know, I either... I either I either change and, and improve and get better at being in the Marines or leave, and I left. But did you did you see when you went into the Marines? You must have seen a, a lifelong career there. In a, in a career oh yeah, part. yeah. I yeah. thought I signed up for twenty two years. You can sign really? on for, you could sign on for three, nine, or twenty two. I signed on for twenty two. I thought that was me forever. Hmm. How much did that shape you? You know that that time in the Marines, in the Marines, because I think people when I've heard you, be, you know, people speak about you in the past, they always mention this this period and Marines. You've been in the Marines. Um, did it did it form the man we see today? Was there a lot of that in your DNA now, or or was it just part of part of your journey? Do you know whenever you I, I think if you you talk to anybody in the military, everybody thinks you get up at half past five every morning and make your bed because you've been in the military. You know you're always clean shaven. Mm. It's not true. It but, and the further I think when you leave, you do straight after you do. You, there's a real adjustment to get back into civilian life for sure. Uh, but what it does, it, it gives you a unique way of uh, approaching challenges and obstacles and setbacks. A unique way of see see when you join up, and it's more it's more so now, I suppose. But when you when I joined the Royal Marines, such a small percent get through. Mm. So we joined up with 64 guys, and only 13 of us passed out, and that's a huge fallout rate. And it's the same fallout rate now, and it's just so physically demanding. So we get. Uh, just in our industry, how many d days do you uh, do we run a week in reality? It's two or three. Yeah. Two or three. Yeah. No more than that, and that yeah. might include game days as well, because you physically can't push the guys any further. Yeah. So, four days a week for eight months. Four days a week, probably five days a week, but let's say four for eight months. You are pushed to the limit every single day. But with the with the, the sort of purpose to break you to find out. Well, as soon as you fall over and break, you've gone. And is it more of a, a mental or a physical challenge, those early stages in the Marines? Oh, it's both. Mm. It's both. Uh, it's mentally just so intense that you, 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 you completely break as a human being, completely break. And if you don't, you're, like, you're a liar. You completely break and then they build you back up from who you are. So uh, So why, why didn't it break you then, Mac? Oh, it did. No, it, it, it did. It broke you. Absolutely, but, but yeah. You, but you hung in. You didn't, well, you break didn't as out. in break as in. I don't mean break as in it completely breaks you. Therefore, you've got to give in. It completely breaks your spirit of who you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever you thought you were. Bearing in mind, I was seventeen. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So I don't know who I was at the time anyway. That, was that a good thing for you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Look, I, I, there's no way I'd have been able to do that at the age of 23, 24. Yeah. We had some lads who joined up with my batch who was 23, 24. And I think when I look back, it must have been really hard for them because mm. they had, had some life experiences. Yeah. I didn't have any life experiences. I wanted to be there. And mm. that was an asset because you were probably so raw at that stage. That's right. You? And just probably determined, I'd say, quite stubborn. Well, stubborn. I had nowhere else to go, so yeah. uh, it's, it's not that it's stubborn. not a thought. Stubborn, yeah. stubborn, a key word. <laughs> says, uh, <laughs> says the most stubborn man I've ever known. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Peacock, probably. <laughs> JP's reincarnated as a uh, over there, but. Uh, so you know the the mental side of it is is crazy. The physical physical side of it, you look back, you think there's more luck than anything. Yeah, it didn't that you don't come with blisters and you know the boys get some horrendous blisters, blood blood pouring blisters after they go on a speed match, and they've got to tape those up right and put the boots back on and go again the day after, and then for, you might have like three days that week where you don't run, and if you're lucky, you might have the Saturday or Sunday where you don't run. So Friday afternoon, they'll go get every medical thing going, get every tablet that they're allowed to take, mm. take themselves up, rest all weekend and go again on the Monday morning and it's just crazy. But I often think this about rugby. You know, when, when you start playing rugby as a, as a young man, you, you've rarely questioned the consequences of what you do. You, you're not old enough to have enough experience to be able to question, like, why you're doing something do you yeah. need to be doing it yeah and that'll be similar in in the military mark you're going at 17 and like you're saying about the guys who were 24 they've just had that bit of experience yeah. to be able to yeah. maybe question things yeah whereas when you're younger man especially when you're young sportsman you just you don't have the experience to question what you're doing mm. to question do i need to be doing this do i need to be putting these boots on with the blisters do you know your mind's quite tricky I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's interesting you know people often ask me about well what's the what's the toughest part of it so when you join up the first two weeks you, you're in the induction and leave you alone and i still think that's i think it's the same now but we're talking 20 odd years ago no we're talking 30 years ago yeah oh wow uh, <laughs> and, and for the first two weeks they leave you alone and it is hard and it's intense and you do some you know you the physical part of it's hard but they're not completely on top of you for the first two weeks and you wear these orange tabs on your on your lapels and that you're walking around the camp and you can't get picked up for too much because if you walk around camp it doesn't matter if it's your particular training team if you're out of order somebody will find you from somewhere mm. and 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 beast you and put you some sort through some sort of pain but for the first two weeks they'll leave you alone and in that two weeks they assume you know nothing so the teacher had to shave, the teacher had to wash your genitals, the teacher had to iron, the teacher had to do everything. They assume you just crawled out from under a rock. Mm. And in those two weeks, you start early and go to bed really late. And they teach you everything. And after two weeks, they leave you alone. They, they almost, it's, it's a weird part of it now. And, and they'll say, right, so what we're going to do, we're going to do Tuesday, you're going to be in this certain amount of kit, and then you're going to be here, and then... At 11 o'clock, you're going to be there in that kit. And at 1 o'clock, you're going to be in that kit. And at 5 o'clock, you'll be in that kit. Mm. And then they walk off and say, I'll see you later. And more blokes struggled with that. Really? Than anything. Having because, life stripped down to being a child, basically. Because, well, the two-week period... So for the first two-week period, they tell you what to do. And after that, they leave you alone. You've got to do it yourself. Right. And more blokes struggle with that period yeah. of... They thought it would be like the classical cliche army where you're getting screamed at all the time yeah, yeah. and you're being ordered to do things all the time and a lot of blokes couldn't handle the, that responsibility that if they didn't turn up on time themselves it would be them that were at fault wow the, you know rather than having this drill sergeant walking up and down saying quickly 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 you're running out of time running out of time have you take and have you taken any of that into your coaching that's, that's my the, biggest weakness as a coach i would say is it absolutely my biggest weakness yeah i've noted this years ago my absolute biggest weakness as a coach is saying to a group of men, that's your responsibility. If I get the right group of men, yeah. it's my biggest asset. Got you. It's absolutely my biggest asset. Mm. But my weakness as a coach, I I really, really struggle coaching and have over the years. Uh, some 17, 18 year old lad who hasn't had any real life experiences, whose mum has put himself together, whose mum's still making his breakfast, who's still washing and ironing his clothes. I really struggle talking to those guys and mm -hmm. coaching those guys. Mm -hmm. Does I that really come down to trust, do you reckon? <clears throat> no, I, or just trust as in, in, in what, in what trust regard? Trust in the players to, to make the right decisions or is it come from experience of you know they won't make the, or make the decisions they should be making? 
I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm. I'm. As a coach, we're all. I'm. You know, I'm all for showing a guy how it should be done, and I'm all for taking them through a process and a, a system and a structure of how they should catch and pass and tackle. But the but, but once you've been shown a number of times, there then there is some responsibility, on the player, and most twenty-five plus players get that, want that. Yeah. Uh, kids who are 17, 18, 19, still knocking your door and say, coach, I dropped the ball, can you help me? Yeah. Yeah. And Fine. then you ask them, have you looked at your game? No. Have you worked on your game? No. Do you do any extras? No. You know, are you in f great physical condition? Are you as fit as you can be? No, because that's the conditions fault. And I really struggle. And, yeah. uh, so then they've lost you as a, I, as a coach that's probably, at that stage. Is that a generational no, but thing? I, no, no, but I found this at Saints. By, by the back end of my, my time at St. Helens, um, when I when I came into the club at Saints, we had a mature group of people, yeah. and there was a lot of role models and leaders within the team that taught were teaching on the ground how to wash your genitals, you know, yeah. all the basics yeah. of life, like rebuilding these young young guys. But there was there was not there was a critical mass of experienced players that allowed to teach and coach the younger guys without the coach having to actually do it, you know. Yeah. But by the back end of my time at Saints, it was the other way around. We had 25, 26 young guys and maybe 10, you know, older, more experienced lads. And the difference in that was was breathtaking for me. And, and just when Matt was saying there, I, I, I rely upon like communicating with people around me, you know, day, at your day to day, you know, work. And that's ironic, Mark. It marks for raising his eyebrows. No, well, yeah, this says you're the worst communicator he's yeah, ever met. They don't mind me. Well, it's a business. Oh, we're, talking, oh, forget, yeah, yeah. we're not talking business. Talking there's, there's different rugby. ways of communicating. What yeah. we're talking about, WhatsApp, needless WhatsApp groups, yeah, endless, no, carry on, carry on. endless WhatsApp groups, okay. for WhatsApp Shh, groups. Carry on. Anyway, yeah, so I need to communicate with people. I struggle to communicate with lads like that. It, who the, the very specific example you used there, of somebody who's come fresh from his family pushing him forward, and saying, right, here's my son and he should be playing. And, and they've come in, and even more so in the modern generation of technology and, and, and you know, iPhones and all of this social media stuff that's going on. I struggle to communicate with those guys. I think the world exists, that everyone's much more isolated now. Everyone exists as their own entity. Whereas when I came into the squad at St. Helens, I was reliant upon the people around me. Whereas I just don't see that in modern day rugby teams, you know? Yeah. And I, I feel like in older guys, they've got that still. I think uh, I think modern day sport, for well, modern day rugby league or full-time rugby league is still relatively young, isn't it? You know, 1996, we went full-time yeah. and people start doing that for a living. So when I turned full time, I'd been a builder for three years after leaving the Marines. And if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. You know, if you didn't work hard, you didn't get paid. You got the sack instantly. If you mm. didn't work hard, I worked with my dad actually. And that was even worse. <laughs> uh, and I worked with people like Bernard Dwyer, uh, Mike Forshaw, Jimmy Laws, Graham Bradley, some blokes who just come off the building site or drivers or roofers. And that, that responsibility, if you do not get up for work, you do not get paid. Mm. And so we had a tremendous work ethic when we started turning, when we turned pro. A, because we thought it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. What a brilliant lifestyle this is compared to being a builder. But we all had that mentality of, you've got to show up. Uh, you know, it's a different world where where uh, your modern day athlete, the, the, the youth are, and I'm not, listen, I'm not against the youth at all. I'm, I think society is to blame, not the youth, mm. you know. If there's trees to climb and you take your playstations away from them, they will climb trees. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. You yeah. know, if, if it was a tough society, they'd be tough kids. Mm. But uh, uh, everything we do in sport, because we, cause we're still too young, uh, is dominated by sports science. And every part of sports science tells you to slow down. Everything's telling you to slow down. Not one piece, piece of sports science right now says go harder, go faster, do it more. Yeah. It's all telling you to slow down. Which I like, I think it's good. I think it's smart. You know, we, you know, when I first turned pro, we we did train too much when it went full time. Under Marty Elliott, we'd have these Tuesday afternoon sessions, field session that went on for two and a half hours, and nobody could walk. We went in, into games fatigued as anything, and nobody mm. could work out why. And you look back, and we were doing like five kilometers in one hour. You know, yeah. for the whole session, doing about twenty kilometers. So. Uh, which sounds like marine style training. It was. It was very yeah. similar. But then you've got to produce. You you need to be an athlete on a weekend. Yeah. So I think the balance we're getting close. But 
what worries me is every 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 piece of data say slows down and it's all well and good but there's one anomaly in there that the the definition of toughness oh, there's loads of definition of toughness but one of the definitions of toughness or criteria i think of being tough is that when it's hurting you continue mm. and that and how and how you how you get a group of young men that are injured that have pulled something that are strained that have snapped something mm -hmm. right yet they carry on I, I don't know how you make them and tough. equally mental health well how do you make them mentally tough yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of athletes and this is not me with an agenda it's just the truth there's a lot of athletes playing rugby league playing soccer playing rugby union they were not mm -hmm. tough at all mm -hmm. they're just big they're athletic and they're fast mm -hmm. and they're actually quite they're very soft but they never get you never get to find out whether they are truly tough because their athleticism mm -hmm. their physical presence get them through a lot Mm. And at some stage they do get found out, but that could have been dealt with, you know, a couple of decades ago when the first term pro, if the coach would be allowed to push them, you know, and, mm. and push them through some tough times. So there's no real answer to that either, by the way, because I don't subscribe to, well, let's push them till the break. I'm not saying that either, but there's a fine line there between understanding the you the young athlete, letting him ask his questions. He needs to understand why. I get mm. that now. You you the, you don't just tell them what to do. They need to understand why an, an athlete who understands why is way better motivated than somebody who's just been told what to do. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they've just sometimes just got to suck it in, wind the neck in and do what the group wants them to do. Yeah. Even though they've pulled their hamstring, crack on, go. You know, it may mean you miss the next two weeks, but you become incredibly tougher because See, of it. Already I've got a, I mean, this is, we've all got our problems, Brian. I've got one perhaps which is OCD and I have to go through things chronologically because I can't see the story unless it goes in yep. order of years and, yep. and I went to Harrow School and they didn't show me how to wash my testicles so right. maybe you know, I've been doing it wrong all <laughs> of these years somebody did it on your behalf <laughs> James Churchill you know, like, personal we, butler did it for him <laughs> didn't we, didn't, we didn't actually have people to wash their testicles at, there as well which what is kind a, of school is that anyway enough about me um, <laughs> going back to <laughs> can, no, can you ask more about <laughs> you it sounds like there's day, more yeah. questions um, going back to the, the, the point where you left the Marines, yeah, and because and you touched on your boxing earlier, yeah, you became a professional boxer for one fight, for one fight, yeah, yeah. which you won, yeah, in 1995, yeah, you kicked the shit out of him, not really, no, but I just did enough to win. Yeah. You broke your hand, I broke my hand on top of his head, yeah, because I, could, I, did, <laughs> I, I couldn't box, yeah, you pummeled him so much that you broke your hand, um. And you, you were, tell me if I'm wrong, but at that stage, you were keen to go down the, the, the boxing route. You yeah, Brian Smith with. came. So, Tony's uh, brother. Tony's brother, yeah. Brian Smith came and took over Bradford Bulls. Bradford Northern switched to Bradford Bulls. First club that embraced summer mm. like it should have done. It was brilliant. Uh, it went from Bradford Northern to this horrible hole in the ground in winter mm. to then the, the best place to be in summer. It's such a transition where, where we played at Odsall. And Brian Smith came over and... Uh, went through the, the current squad and got rid of like 90% of them, drafting a load of new fellas, and I was one of the blokes that they wanted to cut. And he said, the, you, you haven't got a contract and uh, there's no more money left, so you've got to leave and uh, we don't want you. I said, well, I, no, you, you, you've, mi you've misunderstood that. I'm your most dedicated player. I'm your most <laughs> committed player. You've got, to let, you've got to sign me on. And I still remember the moment in his office, says, no more money, decision's made. Yeah. And he was being all right, but he was pretty much, matter of fact, saying that's it. I said, well, look, I'm not going to go. You, you've got to offer me something. I, yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll make it under you. He said, if you want, you can come and train part time. If uh, part, well, train for nothing. Yeah. You know, be be part time with you if you want. How experienced were you at this stage as a league player? Now, uh, limited. Yeah. I didn't start playing while I was 22. So this was when I was 24. Wow. Maybe okay. 25. And uh, so you played nothing before 22. Played as a kid. Yeah. Played as a kid, but I packed in when I was like 12, 13. But then for 10 years, you just wow. do other stuff and then yeah. came back to the game. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so I spent a season in, I spent the 95 season playing for no money to earn a, earn a contract. And then turned pro to 96. And then turned into back in the 95, you know, which was early 96, yeah. back in that 95 season, he says, yeah, good effort, you've earned yourself a contract. Which is incredible, well, isn't well, it? What was your attitude like in that, that year then, Brian? You know, that 95 season, Playing for no money, you know. You, you, I imagine you got some inherent discipline from the Marines. You're probably in, in good shape, you know, fitness-wise. Just anything. Just any, uh, 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 nothing would stop me from turning pro. Nothing, yeah. and I mean nothing. Mm. And what was the driver though to turn pro? What, what, what? You know, was it was it uh, money? Was I it don't. the opportunity? Yeah, uh, I never thought about making a career out of it. I just that was just weird. That's what I wanted to do then. 
I had this massive ambition. I couldn't see anything other than just success, and I'm not. So, what su success is the word I picked up on there? So, because obviously you went down a boxing route. Well, I don't mean success as in lifting silverware. I just mean I wanted to turn pro, and I thought I but could do that. Was it to that. prove something to to someone? Oh, uh, was it? Was, you know, when you look back, was it to prove to your family that hold on, I am going to make something? About I don't know. Probably. I mean, I was a 24 year old psychologically disturbed young man. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I just made a decision to turn pro, and I just thought, nah, this, this I can't, I won't fail. Yeah. Like I was never that, you know. I'm too long to play prop. I was too long and slow to play rugby league. I should never have played. Mm. I should have been a 400 meter hurdler or something like that. Really, <laughs> genetically, I shouldn't have been playing rugby league. Yeah. But uh, that's what my decision to make, and I just thought. And then me, I remember my mum asked me to uh, take her to the hospital once. She says, uh, next Tuesday I've got to go to the hospital. I never even asked what for. She mm. said, can you give me a lift? And Tuesdays were our big day. And I'm trying to earn a contract that year. And I went, no, you have to catch a bus. <laughs> and what was the problem? Was it serious? I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it may back. have been. She, <laughs> she just went, went back from the hospital. She just went, right, okay. And then I, she never asked me for a lift again. But it, I never registered at the time. But it was one of those little memories I had a few years later. I thought, oh, I never gave me one my lift. But I just, I was that driven yeah. to earn a contract. People talk about this, like, you know, sacrifices and having priorities when you're in sport. But when you're in a sports career, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice, you know, like you're saying there, like the family time or, you know, giving up certain things. Because mm. when you've got priorities, it's never a sacrifice. You've already put that at the top of your list. If that's what I wanted to do, yeah, I never the, felt bad about no. telling my mum to catch a bus. No, it's the, at the top if of If I'd have felt bad about it and still... You would have took your mum. Well, if I'd have felt bad about it and still not give it a lift, you know, that's yeah. probably even more sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. But I just was that driven then that... That's what I mean. I've always, when you talk about sacrifice, you have to sacrifice a lot. And I, I, and I just think it's the biggest load of, of bullshit ever because you don't have to sacrifice stuff. Not you if that, not you if, prioritized. Not if, yeah, correct. You've yeah. already prioritized. Yeah. Mm. So I've said, this is more important to me than anything. I'm not sacrificing anything then. Yeah. That's mm. just, that's it. Yeah. And and people, you know, it's such a lazy saying in sport. Or, is, you know, I had to make all these sacrifices. No, you didn't. Well, I'll tell you what people do, John. What, the, what I think... Over the years, I've listened to enough players or coaches speak and they wax lyrical about how it was then. And they say, well, this is my thought process when I went in to win that title. And it's a load of crap. They just they just add a load of romantic stuff afterwards. In actual fact, you're just driven yeah. and it's just ugly. And it's, you know, I wasn't the nicest bloke. I wasn't, and in fact, I weren't, I weren't a nice bloke when I was 25 at all. But I was earning that full-time contract, though. Mm. That's all that was on my mind. A ruthless streak. A ruthless streak for sure, yeah, mm. for sure. Look, great teammate. You know, I love, I love being part of Bradford Bulls. What did they make of you then? You've, you've admit self, you know, you admit that you weren't a nice guy. Uh, I remember the first session turning up for Bradford Northern with this long streak of nothingness, uh, <laughs> straight out of the military. Uh, I think about what I was like when I come straight out of the military. I, I would have been a knob. Did uh, the military make you more? You, you said psychologically disturbed, and you said it with a grin on your face. But did the military? mess you up even more then is that what you what you say no the military made everything the military made everything uh, sense it made everything sense yeah. it if, uh, if the world was run by the Royal Marines it'd be a bloody good world yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so, so just, just to clear that up that, that did good things to you it was going back further where, where well, some it, good of the thing, it did good things to me but I can imagine uh, some of the people I came across as as that psychologically disturbed young man probably yeah. didn't think so, but to me, it gave me some clarity. Yeah. Uh, you know, and again, I just, uh, I go back to the coach. That bloke was never going to make a coach, ever, mm. ever be a coach. You know, you'd have determination, you'd have leadership maybe, you'd have clarity of thought on some stuff, but just unstable in many respects. Yeah. You, you had an unbelievable career at Bradford Bulls. Didn't you? Yeah, it was, um, it was very good. Um, yeah. You won everything, yeah. everything that you could yeah, it possibly. Was it was great. It was a imagine. brilliant time. Yeah, that that team probably kickstarted everything. Really changed. It's like teams come along and changed expectations. Changed the way the games played as yeah, well. Yeah, I think massive so. pack. Yeah, it was just I, a different. The, the the game noticeably moved on, didn't it? From from that even, even the club, team. the Bradford Bulls club was revolutionary in the way that they did the match day experience. They had massive crowds come through the game. They were just there was a real revolutionary team on and off the field. I thought. Yeah, it was. It was in the game day. I mean, Bradford put Bradford put a load of money. The Bulls put a load of money into pre-match. The pre-match was fantastic. Mm. Uh, Carol Decker on there and uh, Spandau Bally on there before the game. Oh, it's fantastic. Wow. 
And I wish they'd a bit had a, had a bit more about me because usually when they were playing, we were doing warm up. So we're getting ready for a game, and every now and again, while I'm warming up, I'd sit back and go, "This is good." This you can hear outside. But, go on, <laughs> always it believe. Was, it was, uh, <laughs> but uh, but you, you were too busy focused on playing. But that was <laughs> they, they they had a, a real go at part of that summer bit, going from winter to summer in that first season yeah. was just two opposites. It was two yeah. opposites. So, and then everybody else caught on. I remember everybody sneering at the Bradford Club because they called themselves the Bulls and nobody had a second name then. Yeah. Nobody had a a, 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 a tagline or a Oh, they were the first, were they? Yeah, they were yeah. the first. And I think 97, somebody else, you know, Gim said, you know, we'll call ourselves Castle Tigers or wherever it was. Leeds became like Rhinos, I think maybe 97 or 98, I can't remember. Mm. But uh, Bradford Bulls were out on their own for, to start with. It was a brilliant time, yeah. I wonder, just, just hearing you describe that, you know, the, the nickname and what sounds like tailgating before whether they'd seen what was going on in the NFL and and because that sounds like that that whole experience they were the first to bring that over and well, we don't really guy, see it these there days there was a guy called no. uh, Peter Deacon who, who worked hand in hand with Brian Smith two very revolutionary guys Brian Smith brilliant coach technician and Peter Deacon had spent some time in the USA mm. don't exactly know where but he came back with all these wild ideas about making it as attractive as possible mm as well as the game of rugby league mm -hmm. so experience, make it a game yeah. game day experience and the gates open for a a six o'clock on a sunday night it was a bizarre time to kick off but we did a lot of six o'clock on a sunday night but the mm -hmm. gates would open up at two in the afternoon and uh it was like a day out for people yeah uh, fantastic yeah yeah so so just fast forwarding through that what, what was an insane time at, Brad, at bradford bulls and a, and a one club man at that stage and you ended your playing career there yeah and then you made this transition into coaching yeah. where Tony comes in and, and, yeah. and into Leeds and yeah. into another incredible 10 how many years ahead of you 15 years ahead of you where you, again you, you won it all having done it as a player and yeah. now as, as a coach yeah I know it's uh, isn't it weird because I never had any idea of being a coach uh, did you want to be never no no I wasn't bothered <laughs> and never. were you as single minded and probably focused on becoming a coach as you were a player no not at all no the opposite uh, yeah. someone had to force you to do it well, I didn't have anything to do, so I was 32, retiring, and halfway through 32, Steve McNamara, who I played with at Bradford, who was now playing at Huddersfield, said, uh, do you want to come and meet on, what are you doing at the end of your, end of year? Mm. I said, I'm retiring, I said, have you got any plans? I said, no, I'll probably go and do something, I don't know what I'd do, I didn't have any money. He said, do you want to come and meet Tony Smith? And this was midway through the year. Uh, and I met Tony Smith, and I was going to go there initially as a bit of a trainer, you know, a bit of a fitness guy really although I didn't have any qualifications so uh, and that was just luck you know that, that Tony picked me up and I came on his staff and if anything that you'd give it I'd give a tip to any coach is that you've got to have a strong opinion on something about the game you might be wrong but you've got to have a strong opinion on it you can't just say I'll become a coach and have no opinion so I had some strong opinions about defense uh, and I backed them up as well on some of it you know I, I, I thought I knew what I was talking about so there was some worth. I think Tony saw some worth in me straight away as an ex-player straight away. Mm. Uh, and that's when the journey started. I mean, <laughs> and when what you look journey, at that yeah. team, Wilco, and, and Flash, that that Leeds team, which you've played against a lot of those mm. teams which Brian was coaching, I mean, it was it was something, wasn't it? Yeah, it's funny. I've, I've, me and Brian have had this chat, obviously, a number of times, but from the outside looking in, you know, you, I think you make judgments on people, don't you? It's life. It's just an inevitable part of life. And I think Brian coached against me for a num number of years. And um, I, I always was puzzled by Leeds, well, how they did what they did and how they managed to be so successful uh, consistently. They always beat us in big games. They always seemed to beat us in big games. And always when they looked like they were gone, they'd win. And... Um, it's only through working with Brian I started. It clicked. I understand it. It clicked in about two weeks of working with him. I understood, and it's hard to distill what that is into into words. Like words, kind of somehow don't do it justice. But I understood then what what it was um, that made Leeds so successful. What and about I think the perception one, you had of him in the reality. And, I came out in the press, and Brian said this at the time. I came out, and I think it was me being a bit a bit narky as usual. I'd said something like, oh, I don't, you know, I just don't even know. You can't tell what Leeds actually do. They don't do anything, but they, just, they tend to turn up and just win games out of nowhere. And uh, 
little did I know that Brian had read that and thought it was like the biggest compliment. He <laughs> <laughs> what he said was. Uh, <laughs> Cause you was on about your team and you said we yeah. got it wrong tonight he said we uh, I remember it specifically he said uh, we got it wrong tonight I think we we started making it up he said that's what Leeds do he said they just make it up Leeds I don't, you, you don't know what they're doing then bang 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 they've scored a couple of tries and it, you know, and then, then they beat you and I thought <laughs> in indirectly that was <laughs> yeah. the biggest compliment ever <laughs> I remember Lee Radford at Ulster at once uh, saying something about our defensive system he said, yeah, but, and he said this publicly but, you know, I get on really well with Rodders and uh, we've played with each other, so I guess it was his humour to me directly. But uh, he said, uh, have you seen Leeds' defensive systems? They're all over the place. <laughs> and it. I thought, yeah, that'll do. I'll have that. <laughs> yeah. That'll work. So you were Super League's most successful coach. You are Super League's most successful coach. Um, you were the longest-serving Super League coach in 2018. I remember being across the way there in BBC Sport Buildings and... We broke, not broke the story, but you know, we did the story live. Leeds have sacked Brian McDermott. Didn't make much sense to me. Pretty didn't make any sense to you. Uh, how much did that hurt you, Brian? Uh, it, look, it was, uh, I, I, loved, I loved coaching there. I loved the story of coaching there. Uh, I loved the fact that we never had the best squad. Uh, they were always too old, you know, they were always mm. spent. Uh, and I love the fact that we that we kept getting up, and that was great. And that couldn't continue. And then we lost a lot of blokes through injury, and you know the three big ones retired: Kylie, Kevin, and JP. Mm -hmm. They retired, and uh, uh, and then we got written off again. And then you know Magsy and Rob Burrow dragged the team through, and we won the grand final in 2017. So you know, at the time, it, uh, I took it bad. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. I thought it was uh, I thought it was wrong. But on reflection. Uh, uh, I'm coaching a great team now. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Uh, and I look back and, you know, I don't, how it was done, I don't rate still. Mm. I don't I don't think. Uh, you didn't deserve that? Well, it's not about deserve. It, absolutely not about deserve. Do you know there were a few blokes that year, players that year, young fellas and old fellas, who give up that year. We'd won the grand final in 17. Mm. And... Uh, Sometimes at Leeds, you know, they got it wrong in regards of when you win, it's what you should do. Mm. And if you don't win, we're going to remind you, this is what Leeds should do. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for the players, you know, it is hard. There's almost like you don't get rewarded when you win. Well, it wasn't like that. That's exactly how it was for the final few years. Mm. Uh, so the, the guys did the treble in 2015, you know, and I don't know. I don't think the club did that, made too much of a deal. They should have made a big deal about that. I don't know whether that will get done again. Mm. Uh, and and then in 2018 we go through a really tough year because of the floods and at the end of the season the the club made a real big deal about how bad a season that was Yeah, you know you're talking about contracted blokes who don't have another living and you know it put the wind up a few players mm. so uh, you know there's there's an element where I think some of the players give up that year it, at the start of 20 I probably got my story wrong there but in 2017 we ended up winning the grand final again, yeah. but nothing was sent at the end of the year. Yeah. If I can get that chronolo chronologically yeah. right. In 2015, we did really well. We didn't get rewarded. In 2016, we went really bad. Yeah. And we got reminded it was the end of the world. And in 2017, we came back and won another grand final. Mm -hmm. Out of nowhere, we were lying 12th mm -hmm. in 2016. Uh, and, you know, I heard somebody, I, I read a clip saying uh, Leeds had a blip in 2017 and won the grand final again. Mm. I couldn't think of a more disrespectful way to yeah. describe any team's wow. win of a grand final as a blip. <laughs> yeah. But then that's journalists who don't know. Yeah. So, uh, but at the end of 2017, nothing was said. It was almost like, well, well, then that's what you should do. Yeah. So there was a, a hell of a lot of resentment within the players about their expectancy to win. So in 2018, we're going through a tough period. And I'll tell you now, some players give up and I couldn't do anything with them try talking to right coach and couldn't do anything with them and that's what it's like sometimes at a big club yeah. and you might think well that means the coach has got to go as soon as they did that instantly all you do is affirm that their actions are correct mm -hmm. and that's the bit of this modern day sport I don't think people quite nail down a full time modern day sport just yet maybe in 20 or 30 years they'll know how to deal with it but rewarding players apathy by sacking the coach sometimes is, is not the answer is that is that that's a big failing in team sports isn't it this perception that moving a coach on gets a reaction from players it's it's more prevalent in football than league for sure but, for sure but it's still 
I would say, a commonly held belief. Look, is it a short-termism that you might get a rocket for a couple of weeks because absolutely. the new coach might not like it or Listen, whatever? Listen, absolutely. That, that, that is talked about by chairman. There might not be the right decision in six months' time, but we need a couple of wins now. Yeah. Mm. Uh, look, I don't know enough about the story, but it would seem to me that Man U still hadn't recovered from getting rid of Moyes, no. who went in there and said, look, you've had this, full, this culture and this philosophy for a number of years. We've got to change some of that. Again, I don't know too much. Maybe he went in there and tried mm. to change too much too soon. But all they did was back up the players who were throwing hissy fits because he was stopping them from having chips the night before. You know, there's yeah, one yeah. of the stories I've heard. Mm-hmm. So, so look, look, my story is different because I had eight years there. And maybe could, could you see the end coming? No, you no, not at all. It was a, sh- it was a no. shock to you. Well, from the look, who just won a grand final the year yeah. before yeah. after dragging the team from 12th. No, I didn't see that coming yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but Brian, when I said deserve, I'm, I'm, I mean, for example, and if you, like we talk, you, you guys were talking about football, mm-hmm. Arsenal, Arsene Wenger, uh, we, they, they knew the end was coming, which is a completely yeah. different scenario to yours. But surely, from someone who well, won absolutely use the everything word, there, I'm not going to agree with deserve. No, but surely you, you you sh- it should have been managed much better than a mid right, they wanted so, the end. So my point is, getting, getting rid of me like that, I, I, I think was wrong. I think it was the wrong yeah. call. Not from my point of view, but the players just went into free fall completely. Yeah. Like I'd been there eight years and I had a fair grip on some players. Mm. Those players might not have liked me, might not have liked the grip I had on them, but I had a grip on players. Mm. And to go get rid of me like that, there was only one outcome. So that short-termism you're talking about, that was never going to happen. They were never going to say, all right, now he's gone, let's win two more games. Mm. They went into free fall. How does a board decide on a decision like that? I don't know. You, you, you better... I, you know, you know what? I can't say too much negative about the club because it's still a great club, and I'm still very fond of it. Yeah. And Gary Etherington selected me as coach when I was coaching London Broncos. He selected me to be head coach. Mm. So I don't. I won't even say too much about Gary. You know, too much bad about that because you know he he gifted me with that job almost. Mm-hmm. Now I like to think I repaid that faith he showed in me by delivering the silverware that I did. But I'm just trying to make a point, not about Leeds or Gary or anybody, I'm just making a point that sometimes that short-term thinking that you get absolutely can hurt you. Yeah. It, it, it can damage, and it certainly damages Leeds. Was that was that the, well, hardest moment in your coaching career? Because up to that point, had there been, there'd been ups and downs, granted, but was that the, the hardest point, you know, the biggest sort of trough, you know, in, in your coaching career, probably, ironically? Probably, given that I'm a sensitive soul. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that a joke? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it hurt. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, hurt. Yeah. It's the hurt. first time you've been questioned as a coach, really. No, not not the first time I've been questioned. And in terms of hard, tough coaching, yeah. London absolutely was mm. the hardest job I've done, and will be the hardest job I've done. We got some tough coaching going on now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, at Toronto, but London was the hardest job going. But in many respects, one of the best environments I've worked in, because every man Jack and his dog was completely for the cause down there. Mm. And I loved it, and London's a great city to play at, uh, to be at. Uh, but that was probably the, the, the hardest decision to get used to, maybe, if that sounds right. Mm-hmm. So, look, uh, you know, on reflection, uh, no regrets. The club don't have an issue with them uh, at all. It's a great club. You know, they're going through a process now to rebuild themselves, and credit to them for that. Uh, but, you know, if I've got any angst, it's, uh, I don't think you should do that to a guy who's been there for eight years. I, I'd sacrificed a lot while I was there as well. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, just say, right, you're done. Mm. You know, the hardest thing I'd, I'd ever do, and this is probably me being a bit too sensitive, is that the team I was with for eight years, which I regarded as my team, really, they were playing on the Sunday, and that was the only time I could go to my office and get my kit out of my office. And I found that really hard, you mm. know. I, found, yeah, yeah. I had to fill the box and walk out there while my team's playing, so... Uh, and I don't think that was thought through too much. That's, I mean, the image of that is in, insane, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. You putting your but, plant and your stuff but, in your know, box uh, and walking out with that, that, plant pictures with dogs. We're doing the podcast, so you know you you, you get a bit deep. But yeah. take a step back, and when I finish doing this podcast, you know, all good, mm. no drama, oh, yeah. you know, and uh, you know you, you you move on and crack on, don't you? And, and being with Toronto is like it's uh it's it's probably the best project you could ever get into i call it a project because it is absolutely a project but mm. it's the probably the best project to get into was that was that a very that. easy decision for you to make that when that yeah for came sure up? for sure that you, do something which affects the game i mean no there's not many people got that responsibility mm. i had that when i was at london uh 
And I used to say to the community coaches when I would do some community coaching, we have all got the best and the most important job in the world. Mm -hmm. Because if you can crack London and give that a good go and give it the resource and, 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 and create some waves down there, you are then affecting the spot. Mm. And there's not many coaches could say that, whether the coach in Super League or National War or Amateur, you're affecting the spot. Mm -hmm. We've got a chance of affecting yeah, the sure. spot. And you've always been one to take on those left field jobs, London, mm. USA, yeah, Toronto, very yeah. similar. Well, yeah. It's very different in there, but similar in some ways, aren't yeah. they? And, and, and with it, of course, and Wilco, you know all about this, mm. the, the, the criticism that comes, people saying, you guys don't deserve to be in here, you shouldn't be in here. You know, you've had to fight all those fires off as well, which which you probably made for. Well, they, come from, for but they come from change, don't they? So any anyone's natural reaction, it's human nature, natural reaction to change. Mm. Somebody that disrupts something is just aggressive opposition. That's like human nature. So whenever anything changes, people, I think, naturally ag aggressively oppose it. And I'd say we've got over that and we're in the middle bit where people are now just inquisitively sort of trying to find out more about it. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is acceptance. And I'd say the club at the minute, we're in that middle phase. The aggressive opposition has subsided, I'd say. Um, and, and now I think the game is more open, you know, to see what we're about. And well, I think, I think everybody concedes that, you might not think Toronto's the answer, but everybody concedes that the British clubs don't have the answer mm. to making the game bigger and and sustainably bigger mm -hmm. the tv deal is a big one that's the elephant in the room is the tv deal mm. and again i don't know the answer but i can't imagine the big fellas sat around a table uh negotiating a tv deal and and it being bigger than what it is now with the same super league clubs in it with the same teams winning the same trophies mm. i can't imagine why that w with the same crowds and the same tv uh, viewing figures. I can't imagine why that would increase a TV deal. So all sports are largely based on TV deals aren't they, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, unashamedly so. And we've got to get a bigger TV deal if we want to be a bigger sport. We've got more money to spend on junior coaches. You know, a lot of junior coaches have been pulled away from coaching in London. Mm -hmm. The sport's brilliant down there. Mm -hmm. It's a very well played, very loved sport down there. But the, the high end, the, the top end, the professional club struggles because they don't have the resource behind it. Uh, and the community coaches have been pulled away from that because of funding. Uh, so the elephant in the room is the TV deal. I can't imagine why anybody would say that Toronto won't have a better chance of increasing that TV deal. Yeah, people and, will and still I, try and argue that, won't they? But yeah. No, but, well, they will try, and you'd always get that opposition for sure, but you would hope those with a bit of intellect and a bit of forethought and, and with a bit of vision would see that uh, you've got to have a, a competitive Catalans and a competitive competitive Toulouse or maybe a Barcelona or something. Yeah. So I, I, listen, I, I, I hear talk in certain circles that the future of the game, this is not my idea, but I endorse it, is the good healthy clubs from the UK with a couple of French clubs and a couple of clubs in North America. And that's the comp. Yeah. That's not the, not a mid season competition. That's the comp. Mm -hmm. Rugby union has got, uh, the six nations, and that's a brilliant product. It's a brilliant concept, the Six Nations, and it's unbelievably well resourced, supported, watched sport. And it's also got the Heineken Cup or whatever whatever format it is now. Yeah, it, yeah. Is it the Heineken Cup? The still? Champions, Champions Cup, yeah. yeah. Champions yeah. Cup. So they got the, that European Cup. And that's brilliant as well. That's very well endorsed and supported and resourced. Uh, we got nothing mm. compared to that. We used to have the Challenge Cup, but the figures on that are dwindling and mm. not many people go, what's the Challenge Cup? So you could attack the fans for that about apathy towards viewing figures or you can ask them or you could actually say well something's not right mm. the fans aren't coming so let's it's got to be it's got to be invigorated by some other means mm -hmm. and i think a competition which is heavily played along along the north of england isn't the answer anymore yeah look we could have done a whole hour really couldn't we just on the toronto project and so on but it's been absolutely fascinating listening to your stories there uh, i want to hear a couple more before we finish you went to japan to sign yes. Sonny Bill Williams. Yep. Tell us what happened. How did you do it? How did you persuade him, apart from the checkbook? <laughs> well, I'll keep this really brief. Uh, so, uh, David Argyle, in April last year, said uh, in Canada to a couple of journalists, we'd like to sign Sonny Bill Williams. Mm. So I read that news over here. You right. know, and... Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Which, straight away you go, yeah, fair dues. But then instantly, as a coach, whose, whose responsibility is all manner of things, including 
the environment and the honesty and the integrity of your team. Mm -hmm. You think instantly when you start mentioning names like that, global names, you think, is he going to fit into us? So, you know, I didn't call the owner or anything. It's absolutely his right to mention who he wants and sign who he wants. And then that was it. And at the end of the year, we won the grand final and uh, we're doing a, a press launch in the UK for David's product, health product, uh, Rugby Strength. And we've launched that in uh, in Manchester. A couple of journals was there, asked me about it. And they said, can we ask you about recruitment? Have you got anybody on the list? I said, yeah, we've got a few people. And he says, have you got any big names? I said, yeah, we've got one or two, we've got one or two. And he went, well, who? And the way he asked me pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> so I just like threw it out there. I went, well, we've got Sonny Bill Williams. <laughs> <laughs> he went, have you? <laughs> said, yeah, we're talking to him. And... Uh, which wasn't strictly untrue. Yeah. There had been dialogue between our guys and his agent. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was out in the press the week after. You know, Toronto in talks with Sonny Bill Williams, yeah. which probably wasn't that true. Uh, at this stage, Sonny probably didn't know anything about but it. But anyway, <laughs> his agent picked it up and then all of a sudden, what it did do is spark dialogue between the two clubs again. Yeah. Uh, inadvertently and uh, within literally a matter of days, his agent said, this has got legs. Yeah. Can he come meet anybody? So... Uh, so uh, I said, yeah, I'll go to Japan. Yeah. I'll go to Japan. Never been to Japan, let me go. I'll, I'll go. Yeah. I'll go. <laughs> I'll go. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> How long did it take to persuade him? Uh, journey. It's about 15 hours. Yeah, it? it's a long old journey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'd, so we'd, I'll tell you what, we'd, uh, I'd, we'd spent so much time on an aeroplane going to and fro, I yeah. never considered. When I put my hand up, I said, yeah, I'll go to Japan and meet yeah. him. And I'm on the aeroplane doing that 14 hour stint to Japan. I thought, I've probably seen enough of aeroplanes for today. Yeah. But look, went out there, he played the semi final against England uh, on the Friday. I met him for dinner on the Saturday. First time I never met him. Did he pay? Uh, no, his agent paid. Right. His nice. agent paid. Nice uh, touch. I was shitting myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Looks hey, I'm ordering, expensive. I'm ordering Wagging. a slice of bread and water and watching <laughs> what they're ordering. <laughs> Look at the price. But uh, it was going to be. I think both both of us understood it was going to be like an half an hour, forty minute meeting, but two and a half hours later, I'm still going at oh, it. Oh, really? And now you know, Sonny is yeah. uh, is a is a brilliant guy, really good guy. Uh, Think so. Humble as anything. Yeah. Got the got massive humility. Asks a million questions, and in the dinner, he was asking me all sorts of questions, just verbally machine gunned me. Yeah. Which was great because I love talking about the job as well. Did you know you had him early on? Uh. You still had to work on it. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I'm not sure. I thought these, the, this man, this level of questioning is good or bad. I'm not sure, but it's when we started talking about boxing. I thought there's a bit here. Ah, the middle ground. There's a bit here, uh, and I just listen. I, I went and asked him one question. I, once he'd finished with my questions, uh, it's funny. I, I'll, I'll remember this for the rest of my life. And I said, uh, "Look, mate, I've just got one question for you, and I've probably thrown up, flown all this way for this one question." You are Sonny Bill Williams, you are the brand, you are the product, you, you've done brilliantly throughout your career uh, and we're clearly paying you a healthy a healthy sum. But you know when it's sideways rain at one of the lower clubs and it's not on TV <laughs> and it's tough and it's going to be hard, mm. are you going to put your hand up to carry it like everybody else does? And uh, whatever he said for the next 10 minutes, he just said, yeah, absolutely, I want to earn respect to the team, that's what I'm about, that's who I am. Yeah. You know, the brand's one thing and the products is one thing, so I earn my living, but I'm absolutely a rugby league player and for the ugly bits as well as the good bits. Yeah, that's really interesting because it's, so it's not you just going out there trying to convince him. He, he, he had to convince you as well, obviously. To a certain well, degree. Well, look, I don't <laughs> think I was going to turn around and say, <laughs> David, no, fellas, we're not yeah, taking I'm worried, it. I'm worried, he's not coming. <laughs> yeah. uh, he he doesn't fancy <laughs> but, but you know what? In all seriousness, uh, if I'd have been a young coach, I probably would have, but if he didn't give me the wrong answer then, yeah. I probably would have said something. Yeah. I probably would have because you, the, you, what you can't have is somebody of that profile uh, not knitting in with these guys. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That would be the worst. Yeah. No, well, we're well, not well, getting... oh, oh, trust me. He's, I mean, he hasn't taken his head out of his asshole for the last uh, <laughs> how was it? three months. And look at it now. It's like, oh, I've, I've got a knee injury, <laughs> Sonny. It stings it's so it's much, but I'm going to keep matching, playing for matching, the team. Matching tube grip on the <laughs> training. Yeah. Pathetic. Yeah. No. yeah. So yeah. he has been, he's been brilliant though, just to back Brian up. Um, there is a fear as a player, you know, when you get somebody come in like that, who's on big money and, and, and the, the, just that subtle influence that can have, you know, upon a dressing room. Mm. And uh, I couldn't be more complimentary of the character that he's got. You know, his character shines through. Yeah. He's inquisitive, he's willing to learn. Um, he's, he's, he's a great, um, he's got on, 
an aura about him that inspires you know younger players or, or some of the less experienced players. He, he, he's really giving with his time, which I think sets an incredible example for everyone. You know, he, he is generous with his time. Do you know, do you know the biggest compliment I can I could say really about any of those type of players? And JP had this: is that players want to play for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and players wanted to tackle for JP. Mm -hmm. Towards the back end, JP was as fit and as strong, but just age gets here sometimes. He would move slow and move, miss the odd tackle. Mm. But people wanted to clean up for him. Mm -hmm. And there was this, I mean, certainly towards the end of 15, when those three were retiring, it absolutely helped us get over the line, mm -hmm. that they wanted to do it for them. And you can't make that up. You can't lecture mm -hmm. to a group of players and mm -hmm. say, do it for these. You can't tell them to. It's got to be a natural course of events. Yeah. And I think there's an element of that with him. For sure. There's certainly that with you, John. You know, the players, you know, respect you and, and, and know what you do for them. And there is that reciprocal effort from them. They make those tackles, put the body on the line. It's a, yeah. it's something that the coach steps back from and says, this isn't me. I'm, that's, that's what they do themselves. Yeah. And, of course, two great players, you, Sonny Bill Williams. But there's another similarity in the fact that you're both unbeaten professional boxers. Yeah. So there's only one way to find out yeah. who's the ultimate. Mm. We've been doing a bit of Harry Hill style. Max had the pads on at training. Yeah, I come in uh, the other morning and Sonny was oh, sweating. Yeah. Mac was sweating even more, <laughs> which was concerning me because you'd just been holding the pads. Yeah, it's hard <laughs> holding pads, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that, that someone was telling me just to finish because people are doing this behind the cameras, Mark. If you, if you wonder what that means, oh, yeah. that means stop talking. Oh, right. There's me. thousands of people here behind. Can you see three of them, John? Yeah. But were, were, were you were you telling me that you? You sometimes come in at sort of like four or five in the morning, and you're there on your own. No, is that something? No. Is that true? No, well, uh, yes, and you're there on and you're there on your own, sort of thinking and doing your own little bit before the. But, I, but I'm always awake at that time of morning. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. something happened early early in my coaching career where after three o'clock, that's it. You're not allowed any more sleep after really? that. Can you imagine this? I'll be laid in bed on a morning. I don't know four hours four, thinking I might as well just get up now. And I think of people like Josh McCrone and John Wilkin and those guys. It's, it, it dominates your brain. It absolutely <laughs> just dominates your brain. The only person who thinks of John Wilkin at four o'clock in the yeah, morning. Yeah, certainly. Uh, not wife. even his wife. That's uh, <laughs> oh, another story. Um, look, lovely to meet you and to see you and to hear, and thank you so much, Brian, for sharing all of those stories okay, with us. The altar boy, the professional boxer, <laughs> the great player, the great coach, Brian McDermott. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.